I have to begin by um, just saying thank you to uh, the Chancellor, to Gordon and Julie. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'll start all over again. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to the Chancellor, to Gordon and Julie, uh, to Tom Kajadin, who's here someplace, but without whom this whole evening would never have taken place. And of course, uh, to the Rappaport family for bringing all of us together tonight. Um, my retirement and intimations of my mortality <laughs> have prompted me uh, to recall the trajectory of my career and of my thinking since 1953, when as an undergraduate at McGill, and in the wake of my encounter with, Earl, with Will Herberg, I began to do Jewish theology for the first time. <clears throat> now that review uh, locates me squarely in this institution uh, because I have studied and taught in these halls since the fall of 1954, which is a very long time. Uh, so there is much to evaluate. And I've asked myself more and more um, what role did the culture of JTS play in the evolution of my thinking? And I want to say honestly here, in the presence of the Chancellor, that um, my remarks tonight should be understood as a form of, of teshuva, of repentance. <laughs> I did not know what the Chancellor was going to say about the role of theology in the Jewish Theological Seminary. Because, uh, but I have far too often toured the country saying there wasn't much theology at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And in retrospect, from this perspective, at this point in my life, looking back, that was far too categorical a claim. It was irresponsible. Uh, I probably, when I said it, qualified it in some way or other, but I never met the qualification. And the, uh, the categorical statement, I did mean. And I now realize that what was needed was a much more nuanced evaluation. I now feel that there was a great deal of theology in the halls of JTS, in the thinking and writing of my teachers and of my colleagues, but unfortunately, very little of it trickled down uh, to the curriculum and to the classrooms of the rabbinical school where I was studying. And this culture that was just in the air, uh, this theological, uh, these theological ruminations which were in the building, I believed, uh, demanded that I pursue it. You know, I always tell graduate students that uh, nobody ever gives you uh, an education on a silver platter. Uh, you have to go and create your own education, which means you have to find the teachers, the mentors, the books, the courses uh, that are gonna give you what you need to do what you want to do with your scholarly life. And I now realize that I, um, I Im imbibed this culture of theology, uh, not because it was handed to me in the classroom, but because I was thirsty for it and because I ran around looking for it. Um, it was not served up to me. Uh, and in a sense, I think, I created my education, but I created it out of what was available to me, out of resources that were available to me here. Everybody has mentioned Will Herberg, and, and I must do that also, because when I walked into Hillel at McGill in, I think, the spring of 1952, um, I heard for the very, very first time um, a Jewish statement that was engaging, intellectually exciting, 
intriguing and existentially very demanding. Um, that moment changed my life. Um, I hung around, spoke to Will, followed him around Montreal for three days, and at the end of that period, I said, I have to be a serious Jew, and then I determined that I was going to spend my life doing what Herberg did, namely to teach Jewish philosophy. And, and that is why to this day, especially at Hillel, but not only at Hillel, when I speak at educational institutions around the country in different guises, uh, my fantasy is always that somewhere out there sitting in the halls uh, in front of me, some student who wandered in for the worst of reasons or the best of reasons, I wandered in because there was a woman I was trying to date and she was going in, and she said that you know, she wanted me to come with her, so I did. Uh, I'm convinced that God put her uh, on earth in order to get me into <laughs> the field of Jewish philosophy. Um, that's idolatry. That's okay. I, that was before I met Herbert. <laughs> um, but uh, that was followed shortly thereafter with a conversation with Harry Ostrin Wolfson um, in the bowels of Widener at Harvard. Um, and I said, I want to do Jewish philosophy. He says, Mr. Gilman, you're a sweet guy, but you don't know anything. I said, I know. So he said, so go to JTS. I said, what's JTS? And that's how it all began. So Wolfson sent me here. Um, and I came in here in the fall of 1954. Uh, I was uh, a confused, unsophisticated um, Rosenzweig and existentialist who was at the same time a fundamentalist on halachic issues, uh, simply because I didn't know there was a problem. Uh, <laughs> and that's, that's where I began here in 54. And what I soon discovered here was, first of all, that the revelation that Mount Sinai ever happened. Um, Second, that Torah was a compilation of various documents written over centuries by different people put together sometime around Ezra uh, with ample borrowings from Mesopotamia, from uh, Near Eastern religions. And that halacha was expected, that God help us, we should not be caught coming out of, it was then, Shopwell, now it's D'Agostino's, at 110th Street on Shabbat with a package of groceries. Uh, so Sinai never happened, uh, but halacha is demanded, and theology, God talk, uh, was nowhere to be found. There was no attempt to reconcile all of this, uh, no attempt to put it together, and uh, the wisest course to pursue while we were students was just to shelve the entire issue and just not think about it. Um, but then there was Mordechai Kaplan. Um, Kaplan s insisted that we must integrate theology and ideology and practice. And he did it. And he had gone through that same struggle, I now know, uh, and ended up with what Kaplan ended up with. Uh, and uh, it all got condensed one day in class in my second year uh, when he said, and I've quoted this so often, uh, Mr. Gilman, Judaism is whatever the Jewish people say it is. And I was deeply offended. And I said to myself, that's all there is? Um, and he said, well, that's a great deal. And I quoted him in a paper. And um, I was sitting quietly in my room one afternoon. And I suddenly got a phone call. In those days, you didn't have telephones in your room. Your room was buzzed, and you ran down the hall and picked up the phone in the hall. And there I was. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Gilman, yes. Uh, Mordecai Kaplan, yes, Professor. Um, are you free? I said, uh, did you want to talk to me? He said, yes. He said, why don't you get into a cab and come over to my apartment? I walked into the apartment, and I saw my paper laid out on the dining room table. There wasn't a square inch without red markings. <laughs> and unerringly, he focused on this sentence. He says, when did I say that? I said, about two months ago. Well, he said, it's a problem, I guess. I said, I thought there was a problem. <laughs> uh, well, he said, so let's talk about it. We spent the afternoon, I in his living room, or in his dining room, talking with Mordecai, me, a fisher from Quebec who didn't know a damn thing, was sitting in the room with Mordecai Kaplan, uh, talking about uh, the whole issue of where does Judaism come from? Where does religion come from? Uh, where is authority to be found? He integrated theology, ideology, practice. And uh, he challenged me in a way that I needed to be challenged desperately. And Kaplan became a role model, and my conversion to religious naturalism had begun. Uh, I began to teach in the 1960s, and I remember feeling that I could no longer teach theology as I had been taught. What had I been taught? Basically, Jewish intellectual history. Um, in my years at JTS, nobody had ever said to me, Mr. Gilman, write a personal theology. What do you believe now, today? Nobody had ever asked me to do that. I did it as part of my entrance examinations to, to the rabbinical school, but that was two years before, and I had learned an awful lot since then. Uh, and I, I shudder at the pain uh, that I would have felt if I had been forced to write it each year during my rabbinical school career. And now uh, that I assign this regularly to all of my students, they know that, and I say, I know it's going to hurt like hell, but it's good for you, and write it. And to this day, I keep getting personal theologies written by students who were graduated 25, 30 years ago. Every three or four years, they just write, write it again. Uh, nobody had ever asked me to do that, but I was convinced that I was, one of the important things I learned from my teachers was not, was how not to teach. So, <laughs> I taught Jewish intellectual history, you know, concepts of God from Moshe Rabbeinu up until, I don't know, up until Moses Mendelssohn or something like that. But I always stopped before the 20th century because I was scared to go any further. And then I had a group of incredibly bright rabbinical students. Two of them I remember, Ed Feinstein, who's now a wonderful rabbi in, uh, in California, and um, Danny Gordis, who one day said to me, now that you've taught us what everybody else believes, Professor Gilman, what do you believe? And I said, me? <laughs> And I realized that if I was going to ask them to do personal theologies, I would have to have them to do myself. And I also felt that I had to teach theology in such a way that it integrated not only theology, ideology, and practice, but also the rest of their curriculum. Namely, uh, how they teach, how this institution understood Torah. And also the decisions of the RA Law Committee. I had to teach theology, ideology, practice, which incorporated biblical criticism and also incorporated the fact that now a Kohen can marry a divorcee, even though the Torah says, even though the Torah says no. Fortunately, at this stage, when I began to think that I, now, I, now I have to put together a personal theology, my work at Columbia intervened and I encountered Paul Tillich. 
Judaism and Modern Man was the first book in my canon, uh, my personal canon. The second was Paul Tillich's Dynamics of Faith. I read Dynamics of Faith in a white heat, and suddenly everything became clear. Um, I think I was prepared for Tillich because of my work with Kaplan, but the issue of the, the reigning issues, which has bothered me ever since, and the vocabulary which I have used ever since to talk about what I do and what I believe, uh, the epistemological issues, the nature of religious language, uh, the use of metaphor in theology, the, the whole notion of myth, of a broken myth, and of second naivete, all of these terms became crucial and central to my being able to articulate a personal theology. And at that point, I felt I had the right to expect something from my students as well. Uh, Tillich gave me a language uh, to recover a coherent theology once I could no longer believe in the historicity of Sinai and in the literalness of revelation of Torah. Um, now, my Jewish, my JTS experience enters into the picture. First generation was Kaplan and Heschel. I was lucky. I came here at a time when they were both actively teaching. Um, we had Heschel Monday morning and Kaplan Tuesday morning. And Heschel taught from 9 to 9.45. Notice, Monday morning, 9 to 9.45. Uh, the graveyard shift uh, for an academician uh, for two semesters. And Heschel taught Maimonides one semester and Yehuda Halevi the Kuzari the second semester. Tuesday morning at 10.30 in Watt Kaplan and whatever Kaplan was supposed to teach, it always was Kaplan. <laughs> he didn't even make an attempt to teach Maimonides and Kalevi. He taught Kaplan. From Kaplan, I learned method. I consider myself theologically, methodologically a Kaplanian. I'm accused of being a reconstructionist, and I say names will never hurt me. But I'm not a reconstructionist. <laughs> but I am a Kaplanian, methodologically, and from Heschel. Not so much from, the, from Maimonides and Kuzari. Those were not the most fruitful courses that I ever took here at the seminary. In 45 minutes, 50 minutes on a Monday morning at 9 o'clock, nobody was terribly eager to do serious philosophy. But I began to read Heschel carefully and slowly. And I read God in Search of Man, and I read the prophets, and I began to understand that what was happening here was that Kaplan may have taught me method, but Heschel taught me substance. That I could no longer speak of God again without talking about the divine pathos. Um, that the image of a God, and very much echoing what the chancellor said earlier, a vulnerable God, um, a God who is, as Heschel said, a colossal failure. Heschel had this gig. He would go, you know, Adam and Eve, failure. Cain and Abel, two nice guys, uh, went to the finest private schools, went to Dalton. Uh, <laughs> one killed the other. Another failure, right? And then, then, uh, the generation of the flood, and, and he went through all of this stuff. Uh, God never got the success that a supposedly omnipotent, transcendent God um, should have easily earned. But we read Tanakh as if uh, we've accepted the conventional view of an all-powerful, transcendent God who does what he wants, who gets what he wants. Uh, Parenthetically, uh, this is a God, of course, who also causes earthquakes. 
where 200,000 people are killed, or doesn't stop it. But that's another issue. Uh, pathos from Heschel, an entirely different way of thinking of God, an entirely different way of reading Torah. Because you read Torah not as conventional American theology tells you to, but in terms of what's there, read the text. Uh, uh, this image of a God who fails, uh, who is rejected, who yearns eternally, who says, hit me again. And this is the God we daven to. And then this whole notion that faith is an ontological presupposition. I puzzled over that one for a long time until I realized, and this is quite recent, that this was Heschel's version of second naivete, that it's a regressive moment in our epistemological struggle to go back to a more primitive state of thinking about God where imagination, the kind of issues that Gordon Tucker was talking about uh, just a few moments ago, where imagination, poetry, myth uh, play a role. My, my frustration with Heschel is that he never said all of this, but it was there. Uh, and it was identical to um, Rico's second naivete and to the guy who eventually wrote my PhD dissertation on Gabriel Marcel, who had this whole notion of a secondary reflection, a reflection that takes you belong the critical phase, that recapitulates, recovers, returns to an earlier, earlier state uh, where God can be present. Uh, all of this from Heschel, the second generation from Heschel to Yohanan Mufs. Yohanan, Allah Shalom, uh, was not teaching when I was there. Um, he was a, a colleague in rabbinical school, and then he began to teach, but I never had him as a teacher. Uh, but I have since reread and reread the two major books that he's published in English, um, Love and Joy and The Personhood of God. My favorite story about that second is that I walked into West Side Judaica and I asked Noach Noach, as he calls himself, uh, Noach, do you have the personhood of God? He looks around and he says, tell Rabbi Gilman that it's out of print, uh, but we'll get the personhood of Hashem sometimes next week. <laughs> and then he said, Rabbi Gilman, why are you smiling? I said, because you're lovely, because you're delightful. Of course it's the personhood of Hashem. <laughs> but it was Muffs who took from Heschel the notionhood that God is incredibly human. If you put together the metaphors, the kaleidoscope of metaphors that appear throughout the Tanakh, what comes together at the end is a sense of a God who is totally human. It's a God who changes his mind, a God who's frustrated, um, a vulnerable God, a, a disappointed God, an angry God, an upset God. I mean, all emotions that are familiar to us. Uh, Muffs made Heschel explicit. I sometimes feel that he took the Heschelian envelope and stretched it much longer than Heschel himself might have done it, but sometimes one generation can never do the whole story. Sometimes you have to leave something for the next generation. Third step from Muffs to Steve Geller and to uh, Ben Summer. Uh, I was lucky. They asked me to team teach. Biblical theology with Steve Geller for two years and then, when, uh, and then with Ben Summer for one year. Uh, I can't tell you how enriching team teaching can be. Uh, forget about the fact that I tried to teach anything. Forget about my teaching. I sat there entranced as Steve in his inimitable, you know, uh, burly, girly, you know, uh, grizzly bear kind of way just talked. 
and, and the whole thing became incredibly clear. Um, these, to me, were invaluable learning experience. And the crucial step to me was nothing that Steve said on his own, but when I pushed him, um, and I pushed him to go beyond muffs, and I said, okay, these guys who wrote Deuteronomy 4 created an image of God that was so entirely human, uh, the human face of God, Muff speaks of. Um, where did they get this from? How did they know how to portray God? And, and, and finally, after pushing and pushing, uh, Steve Geller said in class one day, and that was my great moment of triumph, he said, because they understood themselves as human beings. They looked in the mirror, and they were able to see God in themselves, and themselves in God. Uh, and that's where I first said, uh, theology recapitulates anthropology. Uh, it's the ultimate triumph of Kaplan's naturalism. And from Ben Summer, so human is this God that he even has a body. He has lots of bodies. And what astonishes me is that in this day and age, I said, boy, Ben, when that book gets published, you should see the uproar that's going to take place at the seminary. What uproar? I mean, if Kaplan had tried to say it, he would have been decapitated. Ben is walking around teaching, and he's absolutely fine. My suspicion is that nobody read the book. <laughs> it's an incredibly important book. Uh, so there's a direct line from Heschel to Muffs to Geller and Summer. Indeed, paradoxically, from Kaplan to Heschel, to Muffs, to Geller, to Summer. Because on some crucial issues, Heschel and Kaplan are not that far apart. And I would like to stretch it even farther, and I, I know this is a stretch, and the Chancellor will forgive me, from Solomon Schechter to Kaplan to Heschel, to Muffs, to Geller, and Summer. Solomon Schechter, because Schechter hired Mordechai Kaplan, and in an 1898 piece called Historical Judaism, um, Schechter wrote about uh, uh, discussing that it was the human community who was responsible for canonizing Tanakh. It was human beings who decided what got into Tanakh and what was kept out. And then he has this incredible sentence, and I, I, boy, if I ever get Schechter alone, I would say, what did you mean by this? Uh, it was the human community, Jews, Catholic Israel, who canonized the Tamach, Tanakh, and then he says, but God invariably agrees with the wishes of Israel. Now, mull that one over a little bit. Schechter hired Kaplan, uh, and Kaplan incidentally recommended the hiring of Heschel, although I think he lived to, forget, to uh, regret it. But all of these resources were available to me at JTS. What they did not do was handed to me in a silver platter. I remember once asking Dr. Finkelstein, did you know what Franz Rosenzweig wrote about Revelation? He said, sure. I said, well, why didn't you ever tell me about it? Why didn't you ever teach it? He said, and if I had said it and if I had taught it, would you have agreed with me? I said, no. He said, you had to find it yourself. Uh, the, hot, the school was a theological hothouse. I would add the words in French. Malgré lui. I could not avoid theology simply because this institution assembled a group of great minds uh, who were prepared to confront 
the central issues of human existence as they emerged out of our texts. That meant doing theology. And finally, in my last uh, most extensive teaching experience, uh, I team taught with Steve Brown, who was then the dean of the Davidson School. Uh, we taught a course called Translating Jewish Theology. There are people in this room who took that course. Uh, I taught theology. Steve taught teaching Gilman. <laughs> and I must say that what that course did for me was force me to articulate concisely and clearly a coherent Jewish theology. Finally, lest you think that this entire talk has been an academic exercise, uh, for me it has, but it's much more. I want to conclude with three pleas. First, acknowledge the indispensability of theology. I'm nuts. I got hooked on philosophy and theology because I was a philosophy major and I met Herberg. But it's hard for me to understand how in the, this modern day and age, anybody can, he, can be a serious Jew without some kind of underlying theology. Acknowledge that, uh, but really acknowledge it by allotting theology the study and the teaching of theology, faculty time, curricular time, by cultivating a theological culture in the institution. Two, team teaching is incredibly important. Uh, I would have lost so much if I have not spent two years in the classroom uh, with Steve Geller, one year with Ben Summer, and then uh, nine years with Steve Brown. It brings different concerns and it forces the teachers to articulate, forget about the benefit to the students. Uh, it's incredibly important to the faculty. And understand, third, that there is a theologian at the heart of every human being. Look, there's a theologian in the heart of every human being. And uh, we have to begin not by telling them what to believe, but by asking them, what is it that they already do believe? Uh, I spent a day last week at the Gann Academy uh, in Boston. I spent the entire day from eight in the morning to five at night teaching various classes, speaking to individual students, big groups, small groups, the faculty, as I was walking out to get the train back to New York, a young woman stepped up to me and said, you know, I read about everything that you wrote about second naivete and sacred fragments. She says, can you tell me? I will give you a, a passage from the Haggadah. Tell me if that's an example of second naivete. I said, what is it? She says, and she quotes from the Haggadah, Hayav kaladam lirot etatzmo ke'ilu hu yatsa mimitzrayim. Everybody is responsible to see himself or self as if I came out of Egypt. And I smiled and said, you know, I've always puzzled about that passage. It's clearly silly on the face of it, but the ki'ilu, she says, yeah, yeah. What does the ki'ilu mean? I said, it's as if. So she says, as if we came out of Egypt. She said, that's what I understand you as meaning when you talk about a second, a post-critical second naivete. I said, you know, I have never thought of that example, but you're absolutely right. So then she says, this is from a high school student, <laughs> then she says, well, what about the famous Midrash that says we were all at Sinai? Every Jew from every generation was at Sinai. Uh, is that second naivete? I said, well, there's no ke'ilu there. <laughs> yeah, she says, isn't that interesting? Why is there a ke'ilu we were in Egypt, but there's no ke'ilu where we, we were at Sinai? 
and I looked at her and I said to her, Rachel, that's why I want to teach theology, is because I want to have students who ask me those kinds of questions. I haven't the faintest idea, <laughs> but email me and I'll get back to you. She did and I did. Thank you so much for coming tonight. <laughs>